Good morning and welcome. Um, my name is Joy Shapiro and I am IFMA Boston's immediate past president. On behalf of the board of directors, committee chairs and volunteers who are orchestrating today's program, I'd like to thank you for joining us. If you're a regular at Thought Leaders Programming, welcome back. If you're a first timer, thank you for joining us. These programs provide our FM members these programs provide our FM members um, an opportunity to do peer networking with each other, information sharing, and determine best practices. Before we get started, I wanted to share with you some upcoming events that we have. Um, we have a members pop-up at Jake and Joe's in Waltham on April 11th, a tour in the Seaport on April 25th that is yet to be published, so look for that coming out soon. And please don't miss this year's FM Forward Conference combined with our 20th Annual Awards of Excellence on May 10th at Bentley University, which is open for registration now. I'd also like to thank Landscape America for underwriting today's program as part of their generous annual partnership. This is a piece of what you get when you sponsor. Uh, we are joined by Daryl Swanson, Doug Jassett, and Doug McDuff from Landscape America this morning. I will turn it over to Daryl to share some insight on the company. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen real quick. It's much better looking at this slides than me at 830. <laughs> Let me shift you over. So good morning. My name is Daryl. Let me make sure that these are moving forward. Um, I'm here to give you a brief overview of Landscape America. So I've created a quick, um, few quick slides to review over the next couple of minutes to answer common questions we receive from facility and property managers. We operate in uh, daily in accordance to our core values, focused on building relationships with our clients and getting to know them as much as their properties. This runs within our internal culture as well. A little bit about what makes us different. We have 100 to 150 employees in both green and snow season. Over the past three years, we've had nearly 100% retention rates into the season with our crew. So we keep this through employee engagement um, through open book management. This drives consistent results and a culture where people care about what they do. The next slide shows our survey area, which covers Massachusetts and Rhode Island. For over 15 years, we have been working on commercial properties in both landscape management and snow and ice management, allowing our clients to have one contract and one point of contact for all their properties. Everything's in-house. It's all under one roof and an experienced and professional team, which is focused on customer service and ease of business. We have additional crews and additional equipment to cover any call-outs or performed maintenance to make sure we're always covered. And we operate in a number of verticals from corporate campuses, retail and healthcare to assisted living, industrial colleges and private schools. We're big enough to handle a property of any size. Uh, even through our growth, we've maintained a real local business approach. Being family owned, both the owners are accessible and committed to driving that client satisfaction. And our process is set up to be seamless and simple for our new clients. We do a quick five minute intro followed by a 20 minute on-site assessment and we can deliver a customized plan for any property or properties within five days. So here's my quick, and if you haven't met Doug, here he is. But if you're interested in setting up um, a time with our commercial property team, you can easily scan the QR code on this page and you'll go directly to Doug's booking link and contact info. And you can also visit landscapeamerica.com. We just rolled out a new website for more information. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Daryl. Um, that was two minutes. That was perfect as instructed. <laughs> Uh, we are going to start our program with a quick breakout session for you to do some networking and start to think about today's topic. We're going to quickly introduce yourself, your company, your role, and then answer these two questions. So everybody remember them, or I'll put them in the chat. Am I doing that, Janessa? I'm going to put them in the chat. What changes have you seen in your office since returning to work? Perhaps design changes, work behaviors, added benefits or amenities? 
And what, if anything, do you have planned in your office for upcoming in the way of design? If we could designate one person as a transcriber, that would be great. And then we'll come back and we'll have you type into the chat and then we'll get started with our speakers. So let's go into breakout. All right, one second. And all right, so I will bring you back in eight minutes. That should give each person about a minute and a half or so to share. Welcome back, everyone. Little by little. Thank you. Okay, let me go back here. And go for it, Joy. You're on mute, my friend. Sorry. Um, welcome back. So that we can start to frame the discussion and start to sift through the questions together. If we could have the transcriber summarize your group's answers into the chat, that would be great. Now let's kick off our program with our two partners and subject matter experts who have agreed to share their knowledge and insight with us today. And I have the pleasure of serving as their moderator. Uh, Jenna Myers is a senior interior designer and partner at Margulies Peruzzi who brings 15 years of extensive design experience with her team. As a workplace studio leader, she specializes in working closely with clients to create customer design spaces, reflecting their unique brand, mission, and culture. She has worked on projects for clients such as Fresenius, United Way, and Zipcar. Jenner has been influential in helping develop several workplace strategies and reports for the firm. The most recent report focused on embracing the hybrid workspace. She received a Bachelor's of Fine Arts Interior Design from Buffalo State College. Dave Matson is a principal at CBT with 20 years of professional experience in architecture and interior design, spanning a variety of project types. His work for the last several years has focused on the creation of high performance work environments that artfully oh. blend beauty, functionality, and future readiness. He brings to each commission innovative design solutions that reflect the client's culture and enhance the client's core business and the ability to work efficiently. He holds a Bachelor of Architect degree from Carnegie Mellon University and has a visiting design critic and thesis advisor at the Boston Architectural College and New England School of Art and Design. Please help me in welcoming them both. To get started, we will have Dave start. Thanks so much, Joy. And hi, everybody. It's great to see you um, bright and early this morning. Um, hopefully the, the breakout session uh, got our minds all thinking and uh, Jenna and I can um, hopefully augment some of that. But um, please, uh, um, I guess, you know, we're, we're looking forward to this being interactive. So hopefully uh, everyone can um, uh, have good, we can have good discussion afterwards. Um, I'm going to share screen, and I'm going to focus on some questions um, that have come up, I guess, uh, especially in the last three years, uh, which have really been extraordinary uh, for workplace design. Uh, in all of our careers, I, I think, it's pretty confident to say that there's nothing that really compares to how disruptive uh, COVID has been to um, just our day-to-day -day, uh, work process. 
But in many ways, it's been a really a great opportunity, um, if you think of it that way, to really rethink how, how work is uh, being done in this new world. So how, how can we embrace it? Um, I think for me, the, the one thing that all of these questions are gonna have an overarching theme is that um, there is no one playbook. Um, there is no one right answer. Um, and uh, certainly we're all looking at our peer groups uh, to see what others are doing, but I think also people are looking inward. Uh, what's supporting the mission of the, of the company you work for? And it's okay to be experimenting a little bit during this, during this time uh, where everything is sort of up in the air. So with that, I'm gonna um, start with question number one, which is how do you like to work? Um, I think when we're doing vision labs or, or workplace strategy sessions, one of the questions we ask is, we ask everyone to send us a photo of their, their work from home environment. And I think what's fascinating about that is this, this may be the first time that each of us has had a real opportunity hands-on to design your own workplace. And so um, you, there's a lot to be learned from that whether it's a quiet nook or the center of the dining room table, um, whether it's light filled or, or kind of dark, um, whether it's uh, expansive or, or tiny, um, standing, seated, lounge, the variety is incredible. Um, and I think for me, that tells me that one size does not fit all and that's okay. And that should be celebrated. So when thinking about um, workplace design, uh, certainly a kit of parts is something to, to, uh, to embrace and to think about. I think we all know there needs to be um, great access to technology, but beyond that, um, so many of us have different work styles and different work processes during the day that um, you know one standard setup is, is probably not going to accommodate all of the different variety of work uh, that will be happening um, for all of your staff uh, throughout the day. Just thinking about variety, I think uh, having that choice um, of, of where you want to work every day may not be the same. Uh, every hour of every day may not be the same and being able to get up and move to a different spot. Um, this is uh, our new office and, and this cafe um, certainly isn't assigned seating, isn't the most ergonomic, but it's one of the most popular spaces. It's right on the water. And, uh, you know, on a sunny day, it's a wonderful place to take a call or to have a quick session um, that isn't at a, at a standard, uh, you know, workstation or office. The second question is, you know, how much space do you really need? Um, Certainly, uh, we, we talked about it in our breakout session. I'm sure many of you uh, talked about it in your breakout sessions. Uh, if, if people aren't coming into the office every day, the office can look and feel pretty empty, which is kind of depressing when you come into the office. Um, so, so how do you right size that if, if you're thinking of shedding space? Certainly metrics are incredibly important um, and understanding uh, uh, how the space will get used. I think for me, for us, it's it's uh, really analyzing behaviors and and seeking input from staff. Um, what are your uh, protocols? Do you have requirements of being in the office or not? Um, specific wow. days? Do you have you know the high holidays? Is is Wednesday the day when everybody is in the office? How do you how do you plan for Wednesday um, when every other day is is a quiet day? Um, so all of those types of factors really influence um, how much space you need. And then once you get to that, um, uh, what are the types of spaces that, that will support um, the, that population that is in the office? I think one thing we've um, discussed and discovered is that um, there's a lot of anxiety uh, often when, when uh, trying new ways of work for staff, our staff, <laughs> when we moved uh, a year ago, and certainly our clients' uh, staffs, I think it's really having those open discussions and understanding, um, showing the data. Um, one thing that I think is, is incredible is when we were, let's say, all in the office um, three, more than three years ago in 2019, uh, all the time and expected 
typically most most companies were between 75 and 85 percent occupied on on a typical day there was no day when a hundred percent of the people were in whether it's sick day vacation out uh, you know with a client um etc uh not every space is filled every day pre-pandemic so why would you expect it to be filled um post-pandemic question three is Will everyone have a seat? Um, certainly, the uh, the idea of hoteling or free address, whatever you want to call it, has has gained major traction in the last three years. Um, and how do you determine who gets a seat and who doesn't? Uh, that's a a really um, a, a question that is, is fraught with danger sometimes. Um, is it is it seniority? Is it title? Is it how many days they're in the office? Um, it can really uh, 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 set up some difficult discussions and and some uh, you know some hard feelings sometimes. So for us, having that open discussion uh, and and socializing it with staff is something that um, gives people. Uh, sort of license to an agency to 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 have uh, a say in how how the you know the assignments or or free address system is is determined i think it's pretty clear for, for nearly all of our clients that having a one to one seating model probably doesn't make sense unless you're 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 5 days a week in the office um, whether it's uh, your sustainability mission and and or other you know mission driven um, reasons or just the fact of, you know, not wanting to have a, an office that feels empty. Right sizing your space, I think, is is something all of our clients are going through right now. So um, certainly, there's a lot of great AI tools that we have um, that I'm I'm sure Jenna uh, has as well. But um, you know, whether it's uh, Revit plugins, um, Dynamo, or or Grasshopper, but there's some great um, tools that we have to help. Um, determine uh, that optionality of, you know, kind of if then scenarios of how, um, how staff might use a space and how, how you figure out a ratio of assigned to unassigned based on, on your projections. Fourth question we have is, are we addressing everyone's needs? This kind of goes back to the, to the first question about how, to, how are people working? Um, I think, Accommodating um, a diversity of work styles is is uh, is a requirement these days. Um, we all uh, kind of comfortably work differently uh, or slightly differently. We want you know our mouse to our on our left hand versus on our right hand, or <clears throat> you know uh, this task chair isn't something. Um, that I like, I like sitting in a lounge chair when I'm taking a call. So having those options uh, nearby are are critical for staff to feel comfortable in the office. Um, having the te technology tools uh, in the office so that it's uh, it's not a hindrance, it's not a, a um, you know a difficult thing to get on a call like this in an office. We talked about that in our breakout session, but I think choice. Um, and engagement is one of those uh, critical uh, tools that are needed to, to really make people feel comfortable in the office. One thing that we've certainly seen a lot about is, is uh, um, not that this is a, a meeting table, but um, with, with hybrid meetings, the, the shape of tables uh, is really changing. And it's really less about the head of the table now, but but being able to see everyone and and participate actively in a in a hybrid conversation, uh, I think we're designing pretty much every room now uh, that that's a huddle or meeting or conference room for a hybrid meeting. And how can you uh, shape that table to accommodate that style of meeting so that uh, people feel present and uh, there isn't a a, a, a dip, uh, you know, kind of a presence equity is what we we call it. If you're hybrid, uh, if you're if you're remote, um, you want to feel like you're in the meeting as well, and it's not, um, you know, the folks in the room, and then then the, everyone else who's not in the room feeling like second class citizens. Um, table shape, room design can really help those types of things. 
in addition, you know, restrooms, I'm, I'm sure um, these conversations have come up um, for uh, equity in restroom design. This is a, a, a theater um, restroom on the left that, that uh, is under construction now, but the, the sink area is a shared area and then individual um, water closet compartments. And then uh, this on the right is a, a new office tower that we're designing. So every floor um, in the tower, has um, single occupant restrooms. There's no, and it's basically the same, same square footage as if there was a, a men's room and a women's room with a, a you know, a common wet wall. We're able to get the the toilet count um, with individual restrooms that are uh, gender neutral. So that's certainly something we're doing everywhere, uh, nearly at this point. Um, it, you know, no more all men's, all women's rooms. It's everyone. Um, has their own restroom. I'm sure we've uh, been to rest restaurants that are, are like that now. Um, this is really um, now coming into the office, but it's really about making people comfortable and, and feeling welcome um, in, the, in the whole space. Dave, this is uh, Andrew. Quick question on that. Um, yep. Are those, uh, what's the sign? And is it like, is it named inclusive or is it unisex or is it, I know it's yeah. kind of specific, it, but. <laughs> it, um, no, it's, it, um, we have some here in our office, and they're they're uh, this, they're signed as inclusive restroom. Um, yep. Some of our clients do gender neutral restroom. Yep. Got it. Um, those are kind of the main. Um, I haven't seen unisex in a while, but normally um, inclusive or gender neutral, gender neutral seems to be the, you know, I'd say the the most used terms. Got it. Um, yeah. That's what I'm hearing. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. Um, and then lastly, this is I guess more for. Um, uh, building owners, but um, certainly we've seen a massive shift in in the buildings we're designing of how how to engage the community. Certainly, um, over the years, um, office tower design or building design has has switched from a bit of a a fortress, or or you know you you enter a building's lobby um, if you have business to do in that building, to being a much more um, active participant in the the life of the. Um, you know, the street. So, you know, whether it's uh, a building in the back bay that we're um, currently nearing completion of design 380 Stewart, um, which is connecting uh, Stewart Street through to Stanhope Street in a mid block building, but, but engaging uh, the retail on the street, um, actively encouraging people to uh, come into the building, linger, um, open the building up to a, a plaza to the side, um, or even um, 585 in uh, Kendall, which is, uh, I think, just broke ground uh, a month or two ago. But um, where Takeda is going, um, it's, uh, it's basically an acre uh, lobby space uh, that is, is fully public. Um, and we'll have a, a nonprofit um, performing arts um, center within it that hangs within it, but the whole idea now is so much more about um, welcoming people into the space um, and not feeling like I'm not I'm not welcome I'm not invited into the space if I don't have business in that building. Um, please come into the building and energize it. Is is so much of what we're we're hearing and and what we're um, wanting to do. It's it's a welcome change for us. So. Um, just as a summary, you know, how do you like working? How much space do you really need? Is everyone going to have a seat? Um, are we addressing everyone's needs uh, when they are in the office? And, and how do you engage the community and welcome people in? Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Um, so I, I, all of those questions are, you know, everything that our clients are asking. And what we thought would be helpful is to now show you a case study of a project that we recently completed um, that had a lot of that conversation behind it. Um, and what's important to realize is there's this whole concept of, you know, return to work and what does the hybrid workplace look like? And because not everything is created equal, um, you know, one size doesn't fit all, you know, with this space that I'm about to show you, they came from a very um, office heavy environment. They stayed a pretty office heavy environment, but 
there was a lot of steps that they took to really make the space work for them. Um, with this whole return to work and post pandemic world, culture is the new amenity. You know, there's a lot of amenities you can add to the space to try to get people in. But of the heads down, the collaborative work, a lot of that can still be done at home. But that social part is what is really missing. And that a lot of cultures, you know, office cultures need to get to those pre-pandemic levels. Um, so we'll go through how they achieved that in their space. Um, and they realized that the office space is an asset. Um, you know, you need to give your employees a reason to come back into the office. And I think that's what a lot of people are struggling with these days is, you know, it's it's been so convenient to work at home. How do you offset that, you know, our commute to our commute, the, the cost of parking, the cost of taking the tea, um, what makes the office space worthwhile to come in? Um, so without further ado, I will share my screen. So this project um, was for Boston Trust Walden and they are located at One Beacon. Um, they moved from the 33rd floor to the 34th floor. Um, and when we started the project with them, they really wanted their space to be a place people were comfortable, that they were excited to come in. Like I said, you know, getting people in the office is often one of the hardest things to do. Um, so they really wanted to make a lot of kind of collaborative and, and common areas and make those really dynamic and give them the best views. Um, like I said, they were really office heavy and they still are very office heavy, um, but they prioritized that common space. So what you're seeing right here is um, their work cafe or the employee hub. And none of the concepts I feel like that we're seeing today are necessarily new. They're all things that existed and that, that we were seeing pre-pandemic, but the level of um, acceptance and, and use of them in companies that never might've thought that that was something that applied to them is kind of the, the shift that we're seeing. I know personally, um, I was telling the story in the breakout group, um, right before the pandemic hit, I had my employee review and they're like, oh, you know, would you ever, do you think we could ever work as a remote company or working offline? I was like, absolutely not. There's no way. Well, then I was proven wrong. Um, and now working from home is great. So um, trying to get that mindset for, for these folks too. So being on the 34th floor, they had amazing views. I know this looks Photoshopped. It's not um, but they really wanted to create a space that was comfortable for both their employees and their visitors. Um, they, this is right off a of reception. Um, having that adjacency was really important to them. They wanted it really front, right up close to the company or to reception. Um, so visitors and uh, employees could be in the same space and really feel that collaborative nature of the space. Um, so in addition to that choice of seating and that choice of working, like Dave was talking about, um, they also, you know, we included a coffee bar separate from the uh, pantry area. Um, and this is, again, that, that choice by having a separate area where, you know, sitting and talking around the water cooler. I mean, let's be honest, it's more like the coffee machine because I can't function without coffee. Um, but really making that a focal point of the space instead of the cafe part um, really helped engage people and people actually come to chat there and they don't feel like they're sitting in the middle of kind of their pantry. So the pantry is tucked behind, but we have high top seating. We've got the booth seating in the back. It's a little bit stepped away so people can still feel like they have that privacy. And this was a very, very different way of working. They did not have anything like this before the pandemic. Um, they didn't think people would use it, but this was one of the things we spent the most time on, understanding that this was a place that they wanted people to go. It was a shift in their culture, um, and so making sure it was a space that people were going to feel comfortable and really want to come and kind of get away from their desk for a little bit was really quite important to them. Um, another way of working is the I, that that changed for them is the idea of really equity throughout the space there that's very important to them and that you know they didn't before they were in a space where all of the offices were along the perimeter there really wasn't any daylight to the outside um so when we were building this space making sure that any workstations emanated from the window line um that was something that you know 
understanding that these people don't have private offices, but giving them a space that they'd really enjoy working in um, was important when they were talking about returning to the office. Um, and it was really funny. So even though they only moved up one floor, one of the comments in the grand reveal um, was people were like, oh my God, that skyline is, the view from outside is incredible. They had only moved up one floor, but because they didn't have that visibility to the outside before, they never, they never saw it except for when you were in a private office. So making these workspaces comfortable and inviting and places people actually want to work were really very important to them. Um, utilizing the space in, in the, the depth of the space. So we really wanted that daylight to emanate throughout the entire space um, and engage these collaborative areas in with regular work areas without them being disruptive. So they have a whole trading aspect to their company. Um, it's actually where a lot of collaboration happens. So we really strategically located this, this trading area with uh, double sliding glass doors on either side. So it would go where you just were at those workstations. If you turned immediately to your left, you can see all the way through, all the way to a collaborative space at the other side where people have naturally gathered and understanding how they worked before and how they work post pandemic um, was really important. Um, this, this is a social hub. And again, they wanted to bring that social aspect to the company um, because that's, you know, again, that's, that's that thing that you can't get from working from home. So by having this trading area here with direct view to this daylight and to the collaborative area um, that is really deep within the building's footprint, normally would probably just get used for, you know, storage areas or, you know, the less important, less important copy areas, um, those ancillary spaces, we were able to utilize as additional collaborative space for maybe if the hub was too busy or um, too out of the way, they wanted something a little quieter, we have that space for them. And like Dave was saying, it's all about choice. It's all about giving employees alternate places to work, even though they might have private offices, getting them out of those offices and giving them spaces that they're gonna wanna come to outside of those and, and collaborate and just be social with, with other um, staff members. Um, this space was, um, oh, this is a, a view of that just collaborative area. So it's, it's kind of like a mini hub. It's got that same feeling. We wanted that vocabulary to last throughout the space. Um, while they, they do have hybrid work, um, and I think this is the same with a lot of companies, it's, you can't really go all the way to unassigned desks, you know, completely hybrid, high ratios of desks to people, because there are, there are people who come in quite frequently. And with this company, it wasn't realistic that, you know, not everybody have an assigned workspace. So this office can, it has 95 primary seats, but it has a ton of these secondary seats. So for their whole 120 plus people that are employed here, they all have spaces should some crazy thing happen where all 120 of them are in on one day, they still all have spaces to work. But for the majority of the time, it's, it's more around that 90, 95 people. Um, so that's kind of when we were looking at the, the ratios of how many desks to provide, we, really tried to understand how many people are coming in today, what the need for those offices were, um, you know, like Dave was mentioning, whether it was seniority or, you know, days of the week, whether you get an office, we kind of settled somewhere in the middle. Um, they've got a lot of uh, assigned private offices, but they also have a lot of unassigned private offices for that exact reason, um, that there's there's flexibility in the way that they're, that, that they work. Um, and then just providing, you know, even on the interior offices, because there were a lot of offices, um, making the aisleways just a little bit bigger, providing some sort of collaborative meeting space in between. Um, not that a lot of people would have a meeting here, but it provides some sort of um, energy walking through the space. So if you are in these offices that face each other in the interior, you still get that kind of buzz of, people in the space and collaboration. Um, so when we're talking about return to work, it's it's really the 
three biggest aspects are the right space, the right technology, and the right HR policy. Um, and those are the three main things that we focused on when talking to them about their return to work. Um, and uh, again, you know, this, this looks like a pretty typical office space, um, something that could have easily existed before the pandemic. But for them, this is a huge shift in the way that they worked. And it's just an example of, of one size doesn't fit all and that you can still have a really relatively traditional looking workspace, but have it be completely something new and, and a new shift in the way that they work for their employees. So um, just to kind of summarize a lot of what you know they were looking for is ways to engage their employees, bring them back into the space, make sure that their employees were um, really the, the focus of the space and gave you know, it was, it was important that those were, that was the focus, um, that their employees really were able to use the space how they wanted to, that they were comfortable, and that they were, uh, they were important, that they were, you know, the, I'm blanking on the word, but it's whatever the, the, the most important thing is, um, very important for them. So, just a high level example of how everything Dave talked about can be, was utilized for an office space for a company. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you so very much. I think um, Joy is having technical difficulties and dropped out and is coming back. Okay, that was, Amazing. I know I have my own questions and so forth. I want to encourage everyone to populate the chat with any questions you have specifically for Jenna and Dave, and we'll answer those in the last few minutes. But also, we want to now kind of throw this back out to the participants. So what are you guys, um, what have you done in the way of design to help in this return to work and so forth. Have you taken any of the things that these guys have talked about and done it for your own space? And would you like to share? I can kick off, Janessa, I'll share. Excellent, Andrew. <laughs> uh, Andrew at Liberty. So we were fortunate uh, prior to the pandemic, we had hoteling. So uh, people could essentially book their seat. Um, since we've we've changed a little bit, we're looking to uh, if people are working from home and they come into the office and no one's there. Uh, we mentioned earlier why fight the traffic, take the train, um, why come in the office. So we have these connectivity floors or community floors or active floors, whatever you want to call them, um, and ambassador floors where uh, departments and business units are kind of when they do come in the office. Some we're seeing share. Uh, they're working with their coworkers or friends. They're on these group pings or group chats to say, hey, I'll be in the office on Wednesday. Uh, we have Winning Wednesday socials, which is new in the history of Liberty. We've never done socials on Wednesday, but it's kind of like a happy hour on Wednesday evening, which <laughs> probably why the numbers are so high. Um, snacks on those community floors that we're talking about. Uh, we do have a bunch of assorted snacks and just um, non-alcoholic beverages in the refrigerators. Um, free coffee program. We've always had that. Jenna, I, I agree. I'm joking. We should bring some espresso machines here and uh, people would come in for their morning coffee. Um, but yeah, overall, I think it's, uh, we're trying to make it come in with purpose. Like what's the value add when we come into the office? And then the one thing, uh, I know we've heard some downsizing and people, uh, a lot of people working from home and what, what I'll throw out there, and I know we don't know the answer, is uh, we look at the younger generations and culture and, and learning and the future growth um, of America, uh, no pun intended on American landscape, but um, <laughs> sponsors. The, but do we, are we at the point in time now where we know hybrid's here to stay, businesses and units are downsizing and our breakout group, we noticed some people are actually moving. Uh, sounds like CBT did as well. However, if you look at the, the blip in time and real estate is always moving, is this really just a blip in time? And uh, is it a concern if we overswing to make all these collaborative and great places to work, but then you say, oh shoot, we don't have enough seats if, if we grow or there's more people wanting to come into the office that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. 
I'm happy to provide my thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's no right or wrong question. Yeah. <laughs> Time no, will tell. I, I think some form of hybrid workplace is, is here to stay. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's unlikely that we're ever going to get the everyone in five days a week ever again, um, mm-hmm. especially on Fridays. So yeah, I, I don't see that going away anytime soon. And a lot of what we're doing when we're designing spaces, even the one that I, I showed is flexibility and the ability to um, change as as needs evolve. So, you know, right now they do have a lot of hoteling um, and, you know, touchdown spaces that could easily be converted into offices or, um, you know, assigned workstations should that need start to arise. Um, And that's just how we've done it for them. Sometimes we've been, you know, designing spaces where we fill out the whole space with the workstations and then start to cut back some providing collaborative areas. If in the future they needed less of those collaborative areas and more workstations, we just switch out the furniture and backfill those workstations. So keeping flexibility and future needs in mind when we're designing spaces is is kind of priority number one. Dave, I don't know if you're seeing the same thing. Uh, I, I, I totally agree. Um, Andrew, I think uh, I'm sure um, Liberty Mutual and everyone else on here has been doing a ton of scenario planning of, of, uh, of you know, people, how, how, you know, what if, what if this many people are in, what if that many people are in, how do we need to um, accommodate this number versus that number? I feel like 2023 um, is, I've, I feel like we're rounding a corner and, and it's and it's less tentative um, and we're and companies are getting to a, um, a a normal that that they can say this is the new normal. Um, I think there is um, <laughs> there's an asterisk with anything these days. And to me, the new normal has an asterisk that it, it the new normal needs to be flexible to what Jenna was saying that it it can't be a we can only accommodate. Um, you know, 120 people on this floor. Um, and, and so we can shed all the other floors um, because we, we only need to accommodate that. There needs to be a pressure relief valve um, still, but I think m- m- many of our clients are at the point now this year, finally, to um, have a true understanding of what they feel the new culture, the new physical workplace requirements are and are, are willing to um, more than just dip the dip the toe in. Yep, that makes sense. And I'd have to just uh, agree on the presentation, the slides that you shared. It's it's good to hear the scenarios and conversations we're having internally. Is everyone has with all those different pictures have a very unique um, home setup, and when they come into the office, it may be uh, on the unmade bed or the coffee table or the basement or outdoor on the patio furniture. So it, it's good to see that because we're trying to make a space for everyone, not just for the day, but multiple times during the course of the day. Is it, is it the, the library or the open collaborative floor? So it's just, uh, it's good to see that we're kind of all having similar conversations. Yeah, agreed. We, a lot of folks were talking about amenities within their space. Um, food seems to be the biggest amenity of, of a draw in. Are any of your companies doing things outside of food to draw people in? It's just food. Mm. Food's it. Food. Coffee. Uh, Coffee. And and people requesting, our commercial clients requesting like outdoor patios and fire pits and, you know, spaces outside the office that, um, you know, people can go and congregate with Adirondack chairs and that type of stuff. So um, I'm sure food gets involved at some point, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's mostly the patios and, and fire pits. Yeah, I would agree. So, I, like um, when we were looking for our space, um, uh, that was that was pretty high on our list and we ended up, you know, having a great terrace that we can walk out on um right behind me um and it's been uh it's been such a win um on the on the warmer days certainly not uh right now but on those you know five or six months where on a beautiful day you can um take a call outside there or have a have a meeting is and just walk outside is is um 
for us a game changer. Super valid point. Uh, real quick, we have a, a wall to wall and living wall and a park at 30 St. James. And um, last year they said, hey, let's put some tables and chairs. We're an insurance company, so we had to be round so no one would trip and hit the corner. <laughs> and um, the amount of feedback that we received was we need more tables, we need more chairs. And uh, if you're ever in the area here in Back Bay, you see the three rocks, the fake rocks, because it's Wi Fi. There was such a huge demand on those warmer months or just to get outside and again, outdoor patio space. Um, Doug, I would love fire pits, but Liberty probably won't go for that yet. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Other questions that folks had as Jenna and Dave spoke on anything that they were talking about? I have one and maybe it's like a 19 minute question and we have like maybe one, but what are the AI tools that you were talking about, Dave, that are using for occupancy and so forth? Yeah, I think um, it's a new world of, of uh, you know, whether it's um, chat bots or, or design bots in a way uh, where we're starting to harness um, AI to, um, you know, it's almost like test fitting uh, in a way where like, you know, you, you give you give the computer a ton of parameters and it'll it'll draw things faster than you can and or, or create scenarios. Um, so if you have a, a, a 10 departments in your in your business that are sitting in this area and you can you give them parameters about adjacencies or or remoteness. Um, numbers hybrid versus assigned it can start to um, you know lay out um, and give scenarios of that you can you can run it and you know you have 50 scenarios and you can understand where what are pros and cons of each one so that's what we're starting to use um, as a way of helping it's you know it's not the tool it's another tool um, to uh, to help us um, you know, show optionality uh, and, and maybe unlock something that that um, our simple little brains can't figure out. <laughs> so um, it's it's a great way to, um, you know, to explore and experiment with with all these new tools that every week, every month, every year are changing dynamically. So so we're you know, we're we're jumping on board. That's awesome. All right. I'm going to um, ask you all one question and then I'll turn it over to Joy to finish up. As you know, for our thought leaders, um, this is an open discussion every, four times a year for um, our thought leaders, and that is our FM members. If you see those of us who have, well, me, it doesn't count, um, everyone else who has a virtual background, there are think tank folks. Um, they are members of our think tank committee. They help pull all of the programming together that is live and virtual um, within the organization and we are always looking for more volunteers so you can email me at ifmatifmoboston.org afterwards if you'd like to be part of that group it is um 30 minutes a month and you help coordinate or moderate um one program a year easy lift secondly i would love before you to log off when I say, what do you want to know next? What is the thing that keeps you up at three o'clock in the morning? What is that probing question that you're needing to answer? What is one thing? And that will help us in determining our programming for next year. FM Forward is on May 10th. We have 22 power speakers. It's really an amazing day of content. And after lunch, we're going to invite all of our thought leaders to stay for an hour to help us do a kind of a power session of planning for next year. So we'll, this is to keep, like to have the seeds for that conversation. So you cannot log off, even though it is 930, until you put one thing into the chat. Thank you very much. Joy, take it away. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> I'll just reiterate what Janessa said, that you have to put something into the chat, something that keeps you up at three o'clock at night. Is that what we're Work related, about? work related. Or, that was my next question. Or, or personal development, career development related, but you know, other things, okay. not so much. Okay, let's keep it clean, guys. Um, please put out into the chat before you go so we can further um, 
formulate our think tank programs. And I want to, in closing, thank Dave Madsen and Jenna Myers for such a great program today. And I hope you'll join us at the next one and the upcoming events that we have posted on the website. Thanks, guys. And please populate your chat. I'm going to do something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks,